Welcome to the Aesthetic Doctor Podcast. We don't shy away and keep secrets here. We empower you with education, telling you the truth about all things aesthetic medicine while encouraging you to be the best version of yourself. It's time to look great and feel good doing it. This is your host, mom, speaker, and board certified physician, Dr. Judith Forger. Hello, friends. This is Dr. Borger, and welcome to episode 11 of the Aesthetic Doctor podcast. Today, I'm just so excited to have our first guest on, and it's a great one. Our guest today is Dr. Shamila Revel, and she is a board certified otolaryngologist, which is an ENT doctor slash head and neck surgeon, and she specializes in hair loss and rejuvenation of the face and neck. I know hair loss is something a lot of people struggle with, both male and female. Hair loss procedures or hair restoration procedures are gaining popularity. And I just love that we're going to get all the facts and information from a true expert. Dr. Revel feels very strongly about being up to date, keeping up with evolving strategies in medicine. She is very involved in the American Academy of ENT and had a neck surgery, um, American Academy of ENT Allergy. She's an associate member of the International Society of Hair Restoration Surgery. And um, she has served in multiple senior advisor, consultant, and subject matter expert roles in head and neck and hair restoration. So basically what all of that is meant to say is she is as experty as experts get. Like I promised you, we we're going to get the real facts from the real experts. So here is Dr. Ravel and let's just dive into our conversation into hair loss and hair restoration. So what types of hair restoration do you mainly do in your practice? So I specialize in medical and surgical hair restoration for both males and females. Um, you know, I like to take uh, a real um, systematic approach to all of my patients because a lot of hair loss is rooted in medical causes. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, a lot of people feel that it's just a cosmetic concern, but it isn't. It's deeply rooted in medical issues, and it has a lot of um, effect not only on their overall health, but also on their self-esteem. So I want to make sure I'm being really thorough and uh, really treating the problem that is, uh, you know, at the, at the base of it. So uh, I would say medical and surgical, we start with the medical options, kind of see what's appropriate for my patients. And then if we need to do some restoration with um, regenerative uh, type of modalities or surgical, then I have those in my toolbox as well. I absolutely love that. And that's really all that I'm about in my practice too, is to really kind of look at the real causes, um, restore patient self-esteem and really make their life kind of the best version of their life that we can medically do. So let's go through all the hair restoration in a little bit of a step-by-step fashion. Um, What are some of the medical options for hair restoration? Because, you know, some of our listeners might really not know that much about hair restoration. And I think this is a great introduction to actually even tell people, hey, this is out there. There are specialists that specialize into this. You don't have to feel self-conscious. There might be something that can be done. Absolutely. And I think this is pretty much a bigger problem for females than it is for males. I think for males, one, while it is more acceptable to have thinning hair and balding in males, they also have a lot more resources to be able to get help when they, when they need it. Um, But females will often be left in the shadows. You know, they don't want to talk about it. They feel awful about it. Um, But there's not really any clear cut place to turn to. Mm -hmm. Um, So, you know, when we look at male versus female hair loss, For most males, we can kind of tell what the underlying issue is. It's usually uh, driven by a hormone called dihydrotestosterone. So we get the typical male pattern hair loss. Um, You know, as those dihydrotestosterone levels wax and wane throughout life, you'll find that there is an influence in the levels of those hormones. There's also the influence of genetics. So people will tend to look like their family members. Um, But for females, hair loss actually can be pretty complex. We can have a little bit of that hormonal influence, but we can also have other hormones at play, Um, you know, thyroid hormones, uh, estrogen and progesterone. We can also have issues with anemia or vitamin, you know, deficiencies. So when I look at patients, you know, typically if 
the cause seems to be a little bit more complex, you know, just a laboratory evaluation can give me a lot of information, you know, try to figure out where are their hormones lying? Um, are there issues that, uh, you know, lie with their vitamins? Are there things that we can easily top off? Um, do I need to send them to an endocrinologist for a little bit of help in that uh, regard? Um, so uh, some laboratory data is always very helpful. I always examine all my patients with the microscope. I look at their scalps with the microscope because there are some hair loss types that are actually um, more inflammatory based or autoimmune based. Um, we can have patients who are losing hair because they're developing scar tissue in their scalps. And so these are things that you won't be able to identify with lab tests. You actually have to take a look at the scalp. Sometimes they need a biopsy. So I have uh, dermatology colleagues to whom I can send my patients and get those biopsies if we need to. And then once we kind of have a diagnosis, um, you know, based on the particular diagnosis that there is, there's, there's a lot of different things that we can do. That is really fascinating. And I think that really underscores really how much an expert like you prides themselves in their expertise. And that it's really not just what you see that the things that we do are so much deeper. And that that's what a real expert will do is really target their approach. And, you know, fascinating, fascinating. So, um, you know, so we talked about medical treatments. What are some of the most conventional medical treatments that you do? Well, so hair loss is rooted in, um, you know, a uh, decrease in the delivery of nutrients and oxygen for the most part. Even the hormonal influence of dihydrotestosterone plays into the decrease in blood flow to the hair follicles. So a lot of what we do is to try to reduce that influence of dihydrotestosterone for males. So we often use the medication called finasteride, um, just kind of depending on whether that, you know, the patient is a candidate for that medication. Um, and I, we also use a lot of minoxidil. Most patients are familiar with the term Rogaine. They get mm -hmm. to see it over the counter and most patients have actually tried it for a while. Um, there's a lot of misunderstanding though, about how we're supposed to use that medication effectively. Minoxidil helps to bring more blood flow to the scalp. And so it helps to um, kind of reverse the effects of the hormones on hair loss. Um, but you have to use it consistently and things are not going to happen overnight. A lot of patients will use it for a month or two and, and just become very impatient and say, I'm not saying anything, but the, the biology of hair growth requires that you're using a medication for at least six months. Oh, wow. um, yeah. And the other thing too, is that it's not very well explained is that, um, you know, if you discontinue the medication, um, a lot of patients are, are worried that they're going to lose all of the effects of that, uh, that growth. And that's not entirely what happens. What happens is the hairs are, you know, sort of brought out of sync with their genetic programming when we're on a medication like minoxidil. And then when we discontinue it, they tend to, uh, try to reset back to their genetic programming, but now they're asynchronous. They're not, they're not mm -hmm. in the time frame or the cycling that they were supposed to. So you can end up having more hair that sheds, and then maybe there's a lag period before they regrow. They will regrow, maybe not as, you know, as, uh, as strong as they were on the minoxidil, but it's not a lost cause. And so I have to counsel my patients a lot with those. When we look at female hair loss and we have those things like the thyroid influence or the vitamin D or, you know, the autoimmune issues or whatever, you know, so certainly we, we look at the medications that would be required to kind of bring them back into balance. Um, I have a lot of perimenopausal females who start to lose hair. And for them, um, that DHT or androgen influence can become a lot more important. And so we're looking at medications to kind of help curb the symptoms from, from you know, the changes that they're going through. Um, so that's where the medical therapy uh, piece comes in. That is just so fascinating. And I'm already learning so much. So thank you. And I'm sure our listeners are learning a lot too. So I know we had talked a little bit offline that being the expert that you are, you also do a lot of the cutting edge kind of more regenerative type treatments. And I'm sure people that kind of follow stuff on the internet or social media or any of that, they probably hear a bunch of stuff about that. So tell me what is sort of cutting edge regenerative in um, hair restoration? Yeah. So, you know, a lot of also besides the decrease in circulation that we have in our scalps, we're also aging. Um, so hair loss is a progressive phenomena for both males and females. Um, generally it starts in our, you know, twenties for some people, it starts even sooner, like at the onset of puberty. Um, but it's a progressive phenomena because our cells are always aging. There's really nothing that we can do to stop, you know, mother time or, or anything like that. So, um, what we find is, is that if we can actually rejuvenate the scalp, if we can help to rejuvenate the structures that support hair growth, 
we can often get um, a, not necessarily a reversal, but a, a, a reinforcement or a fortification of the hair growth process. And we can salvage some of those hair follicles that have been sort of becoming a little tired, a little dormant, um, and have them grow better. Um, so some of the technologies that we use for this is to help the body kind of tap into its own healing ability. Um, I use PRP a lot. PRP stands for platelet-rich plasma. Um, we have uh, in our blood, you know, several components, you know, the red blood cells, the white blood cells and the platelets, the platelets are actually where um, all the growth factors are contained. And they're really kind of magical molecules because, you know, if we get a cut and starts to bleed, first the bleeding stops because the platelets have sort of tamponaded off that bleeding, but then they release the growth factors. And so the skin gets repaired, the blood vessels get repaired, basically all the tissues that were injured get repaired. So when we do a PRP treatment, we're trying to harness that same ability and kind of direct, like manipulate it to direct it in the area that we want. We're not adding anything to the blood. We're simply concentrating it down and injecting it to the area where the follicles are a little tired, a little weak, the hair growth has been you know, sparse. Um, and then we activate it mechanically with microneedling. And microneedling independently has been shown to be very effective for keeping the collagen bundles in the scalp healthy, uh, for getting the support structures for hair growth healthy. So when we combine the two, we really get a beautiful synergistic effect. And I've had great success in my uh, male and female patients um, in helping that hair to come back. Um, now, you know, one of the things that I explained to my patients is that when hair has, you know, reduced beyond a certain caliber, when we've really had it miniaturized quite a bit, we don't necessarily feel that we're going to get much of it back. So, you know, we have to have a healthy expectation as to the amount of hair that can be regenerated. Some hairs are going to still end up going and, and that's just the way it is. But, um, PRP is one of the types of uh, treatments that I do. Uh, low level laser light therapy is another uh, modality that I use. Low level, low level laser light therapy has been used in medicine for over 50 years. So it's nothing new. Uh, use in the scalp and in the facial skin has recently come a vogue, um, and which is really great actually, because it's very safe. Um, you know, the lights penetrate only down into the skin. A lot of patients will get concerned about radiation effects, but this is non-radiative uh, light. So um, it's very safe. Uh, the therapy is, um, you know, very wonderful at increasing circulation in the area at you know, pulling away toxins. Um, and basically I, I tell my patients, it's kind of like photosynthesis for your hair follicles. You know, we're getting light energy to cause those hair follicles to, you know, do more work and, and create more energy. Um, and it, it really can be very effective. Awesome. And, you know, in my practice, I do PRP as well. So, um, you know, we do a lot of PRP for face, we do some PRP for hair loss, um, you know, and we do low level um, light therapy for anti aging as well. Um, so just for the listeners that are out there, does that mean we can buy every helmet that Amazon sells? Or does that mean we need a special one? That's a great question, Judith. Actually, we, um, you know, when you look at the data for efficacy of the low level laser light therapy, um, there is a relationship between the energy output and the excitability of the hair follicles. Um, if you have too much energy output, you can actually fatigue the hair follicles. If you don't have enough, I mean, the therapy will be effective, but it just might take a very long time or it may not be enough to activate the hair follicles. So we're looking at um, really getting a medical grade uh, therapy device. Um, there's a lot of uh, devices available, you know, online, direct to consumer, you know, through Amazon, etc. cetera. Um, and I caution my patients who are looking to maybe try to save some money on buying these devices is that you really are going to get what you're paying for. Um, that said, a lot of the direct to consumer uh, companies are having you pay for their marketing costs. And so uh, the device that I actually prescribe to my patients is only through a prescription. And so uh, it ends up being, you know, affordable, very effective. You know, I can vouch for the results because the energy level is, has been matched to the excitability for their follicles. Um, so I would say, don't go run out and buy something. Definitely see your physician who specializes in hair restoration or in uh, aesthetic medicine and make sure that you're getting a device that is, you know, is going to work for you and be worth the money that you've spent on it. Absolutely. And I think, again, that's a very recurring theme yep. throughout the podcast is that, you know, experts are experts and we take a lot of pride and we do a lot of training and especially talking to somebody like you, I think is just so valuable because I, I think it just opens up people's eyes that, wow, there is so much to know about this. And if you go seek out a physician like yourself, and especially an expert that specializes that, you know, that that is not something that somebody learns, um, 
over a weekend or in a course kind of, this is years of expertise and training. Um, And, you know, one of the things that I've heard about PRP and the regenerative options is sort of thinking about like how many seeds do you have in your garden and we can water them and we can optimize their growth. But, you know, sometimes there's only so many seeds in the garden and that kind of probably brings us to your final category of um, the surgical options for hair restoration. Yeah, no, thank you. So yes, you're absolutely right. There's only so many seeds in our garden. So those are the ones that we can try to help to grow. Um, But sometimes we have to plant more seeds. And so um, I do uh, surgical hair restoration. So hair transplant surgery for both males and females. Um, And you know, there's a few things that make someone an appropriate candidate for hair, for hair transplant surgery. One is um, we have to understand why it is that they were losing hair in the first place. If you have an autoimmune problem, if you have a scarring alopecia, what we say is that's a hair loss related to scar tissue growing into your scalp, you're likely not going to be a hair transplant candidate because those scraps are not going to grow or they're going to be destroyed by your body. So that's very important for, for me to get a microscope exam, to make sure that we're not dealing with one of those. And sometimes even a biopsy, like I'd mentioned before, when we don't, when we've ruled out any of those reasons for where the grafts would not live, um, or it would, or it would trigger further inflammation for my patient, then we can take a look at how much area needs to be restored and how much donor area does a patient have, even in patients who seem to have pretty, you know, male, you know, pretty typical male or female pattern hair loss. If you take a look at their donor zones, you might find that it's an unstable donor zone. They have miniaturization or reduction in the size of their hair follicles, even in those zones. So those are people who, you know, I might give pause to gene transplant also. But if you take away all those, you know, contraindications to surgery, and we just take a look at a patient who comes in who seems to have pretty uh, typical male pattern or female pattern hair loss, it's making them self-conscious. They don't like how their hair looks in the wind or when it gets wet, um, and they seem to have a decent donor supply, then we can start to make a plan as to how to restore the density in the areas that they're missing. For males, you know, we, we draw a hairline that is reasonable, that is acceptable for their ethnicity, uh, for their age, and also for their height. So I'll take a look at the patient's height, take a look at the shape of their face, and together we'll design a hairline that looks good. You know, we want it to look natural. We don't want it to look uh, done up. And we want it to be age appropriate so that they can grow into it for the next 20 years and not have it look fake. For my female patients, it's a little different because most female pattern hair loss tends to preserve the hairline. So they have hair in the front along their hairline. It's just gotten very thin in the back. Um, And for my female patients, we're not really looking to replace all of those empty areas. We're trying to strategically transplant hair so that the hair can be styled in a way Mm -hmm to cover those spots. So those are some of the considerations that go in is is stability of the donor area, how much donor area we have, how much area we need to cover. Um, And oftentimes I will uh, offer to my patients that we have the ability to do a hybrid uh, restoration, which is part surgery and part micropigmentation. And that's something that I offer in my office as well. Yep. We use a uh, charcoal based pigment. So it's highly inert or not reactive. In most cases, um, we certainly can have the possibility of an allergic reaction or, you know, so we do the patch testing, but, um, for the most part, it's very safe. Um, it's not quite a tattoo. It's a medical grade pigment that is then, um, you know, placed by needle into thousands of little dots that they look like hair follicles. And it looks very, very natural. gives the illusion of a lot more density. So sometimes we can- that's sort of like the microblading that people do to their eyebrows? Yep. It's very similar. Microblading is done in a different plane. It's a, and it's also the size of the blade is a little bit different, Um, but we do actually offer brow pigmentation as well um, because I do a lot of eyebrow transplant as well. So it helps to kind of polish up and, and finalize it hair restoration so that we can really carry the results of the hair transplant longer, um, and be able to stretch that to really provide coverage and and make the patient feel, you know, very good about it. Um, so, you know, the one thing that I would say in terms of hair transplant surgery is, you know, having multiple surgeries is not the exception. It's actually the rule, um, hair loss is progressive and, you know, we, we have a certain physical limitation with our instruments as to how close or how densely we can pack those grafts. We also want to make sure we're not over, um, straining the blood supply that exists in that part of the scalp. So to have to come back and fill in some more density, this is pretty usual. Um, it doesn't mean that you didn't have a good transplant 
transplant. It doesn't mean that you, um, you know, that the transplant didn't live. It is just the nature of the beast. And, you know, when we come in for a second pass with density, the original grafts are holding on real strong. The skin is ready to take some more. Um, and so it's a work in progress. Um, anything that we do for the hair is going to require a commitment. Um, you have to maintain on medications afterward to hold on to the native hairs that are not being replaced with the transplant. Um, and hair loss is progressive. So it's going to be, you know, a matter of time before that transplant also looks thin again, and we've got to come in and, and do a little bit of work. But again, a hybrid approach can sometimes make those, those periods longer before we have to come in and do something again. That's awesome. And you actually already um, kind of answered my next question about how permanent it is, because mm -hmm. it's sort of like aging, everything yeah. is progressive. And that's what yep. I tell people that even if we do collagen stimulating treatments, we kind of bump you back up that curve, right. but then you start sort of sliding down that curve of aging. So we can kind of give you a bump and push you up that hill, but you know, it, the hill's still there. Exactly. Um, so I'm fascinated by you just mentioning eyebrow transplants. I had no idea that that was a thing. Yeah. Tell me just quickly about that because I'm just like, my mind is blown right now. <laughs> well, we can do eyebrow transplant. We do beard transplants, mustache transplants. So we, wow. you know, anywhere where you have hair bearing skin, you could uh, transplant other grafts in there. You know, the nuances with eyebrow transplant are that the hairs are a little bit different, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, they don't grow as long. They grow to a certain length and then they recycle. But when we're using grafts or when we're using, um, when we're harvesting grafts for the eyebrows, we're usually taking them from the scalp. And so when we are transplanting, we want to make sure that we're trying to match the texture of those hairs as much as possible. The fineness, we don't want to necessarily put coarse hairs from the head, but fine, maybe softer ones from the nape of the neck. Um, and then it is a very high maintenance procedure. Um, there's a lot of trimming. There's sometimes some shaping and training that's involved. Uh, but I tell you the restoration and self-esteem for my patients who have their eyebrows replaced, whether it's from over plucking when they were younger or, you know, a wax burn or from, you know, trichotillomania, having a habit of pulling them out, or even from, you know, other, uh, you know, autoimmune or just inflammatory types of alopecias. Once those have burnt out and we do an eyebrow transplant, it, it's amazing. I mean, the eyebrows form a frame for the eyes, right? Just Absolutely. like our hairline forms a frame for the face. So um, it, it changes dramatically how people, you know, how confident they feel to go out and, and not have to worry about penciling it in every time. And um, especially too with masks now, you know, all yeah. you see is that upper third yes. of the face. So it's probably even more noticeable. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. But and beards are the same way. We, we do beard transplants as well for the same reason. Um, and so, uh, yeah. That is so cool. So let me ask you, how did you get into that? Because I read your bio earlier and you did, um, you know, a facial plastics fellowship. So how did you make the bridge from that? I'm sure there was some training involved in that, but to being like such an expert in hair restoration and being so passionate about that topic, how did that come to be? Yeah. So I actually didn't do a facial plastics fellowship. I um, trained in otolaryngology and head and neck surgery, but the program that I was at was quite heavy in facial plastics. Um, so I got a lot of training that way um, without doing the fellowship, but I did do some advanced training in hair restoration afterward. Um, and uh, what I would say is what drew me to this field, um, you know, Certainly when operating in the head and neck area, when we were taking care of patients who had cancers or uh, issues with, you know, their sinuses, you know, restoration of the senses and also being able to put our patients back together to be able to present themselves to the world. This is a, a key piece. You know, you can't just, um, you can't just address the pathology. You have to address the whole person. So it was very, always very important to me. Um, and the, the bit about the hair and just overall rejuvenation, I think that stuck with me. Um, these are patients who sometimes are afraid to get help and um, they really don't know where to turn. And certainly being a female who's, you know, in her forties and in my own hair is starting to thin my Myself. I mean, you know, I know that there was a, a paucity of, um, there's always been a paucity of options for people like me. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I think for me, this, uh, uh, this is a great way for me to be able to provide a resource, uh, you know, because I could understand where people are coming from. That is just fascinating. And thank you for doing what you do. Um, so one of the things that I like to ask all of my guests is like, what is your favorite aesthetic procedure to perform on patients? 
Well, I would say for hair, my favorite procedure is probably the PRP. Um, mm -hmm. I think that even within one treatment, although we do it as a series of three, even with one treatment, patients will come back on that second treatment and say, my hair just feels like it's got more body. Um, it's just sitting better and my scalp feels better and my itching all stopped. That's kind of the key thing. They say my itching stopped and nothing else, you know, really worked before. So it's very gratifying for both me and the patient um, to see how this goes. Um, and you definitely, you know, with the three uh, treatments and then some maintenance treatments afterward, uh, we have a lot of success with awakening those follicles that have been uh, sort of tired. Uh, when it comes to facial aesthetics, probably my most favorite treatment um, is what we call our Trebella treatment. It's kind of a three in one um, and it's perfect for, you know, lightening sunspots that are on the face, discoloration, you know, tightening up, you know, photo aged skin, um, resurfacing it. We do some fractional ablation um, and then we do some tightening uh, of, you know, collagen tightening with radio frequency and magnetic pulse. Um, and it is just such an effective all-in-one combo treatment. And it's very pampering. My patients come in for about 90 minutes and, you know, we have uh, just all these beautiful serums that we're able to use after that are part of my medical grade uh, skincare line, um, you know, to help boost the collagen, help brighten the skin, um, you know, just get the ceramides uh, to restore the skin barrier. So it's a really fantastic, very effective treatment. Um, and, you know, we just love performing those too. All right. So a little bit of a tell all, what is your favorite aesthetic procedure to get personally? I love microneedling personally. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, awesome. I love microneedling. I find it to be very, very effective. I can do it myself. <laughs> yes, that is, that is always the thing. Like, I feel like I'm going to need to fly to you now to experience this treatment. <laughs> no, it really is fantastic. Um, you know, in terms of downtime, very little downtime, but it is so effective. Um, you know, microneedling or really any of our uh, modalities for skin rejuvenation, they really involved controlled damage to the skin. And what we're doing is we're trying to boost skin to repair itself by increasing its collagen production, pulling in, you know, hydration. Um, and by doing so, then we end up, you know, filling in kind of those divots that we create, uh, you know, with the wrinkles and, and with photo aging. So um, it, it's just, it's amazing. It feels good um, and it's very effective. It's perfect for acne scars. Um, so I have a lot of patients who come in whose acne has been controlled medically, but then they're left with all these scars um, and we can really remodel that skin for them. Um, and, uh, you know, it's gentle, it's good for all skin types. So that's the other thing too, with me being a little bit darker, I'm a Fitzpatrick four plus. Um, there's some treatments that just, you know, would not do well with me because of the risk of hyperpigmentation. So I love microneedling too, because I know I can go to town on my, on my skin and, and not have to worry too much. Um, yeah. Plus I, I always love it too, when we can kind of natural restore some of the stuff. And I think, you know, we can boost our own body. We can use the natural healing mechanism. We don't just use, even though I'm all for chemicals and it is lovely when you can use kind of your own natural healing processes to restore. Yeah, I agree. So you have mentioned so much good stuff and I want to thank you. And I know on behalf of myself and my listeners, I definitely learned something. You have mentioned having your own skincare line. You obviously have your Institute. Why don't you tell everybody how they can find you, how they sure. can connect with you. And we'll also put that in the show notes. Wonderful. No, I appreciate that so much. So I, my practice is in Madison, Wisconsin. Sometimes I see patients in Chicago as well. Um, and uh, the best way to reach out to us would be either to call the office at 608 721-6132. Um, or you can book online at my website. That's www.theravel Institute. So it's T-H-E-R-A-W-A-L institute.com. It's a mouthful. I, I, after I created my website, I realized that this is maybe not the best, uh, the best title, but that's where you'll find us. At you least it's unique find though. Again. Yeah, it is. That's true. It says what it is. Uh, but you know, probably the easiest way for most of the listeners to find us is if you go on Instagram and uh, look at at Madison hair doc. So it's M A D I S O N H A I R D O C Madison hair doc. Uh, that's our handle for both Instagram and Facebook. Um, and you can certainly find the ability to book appointments or get more information from us that way. Well, that's wonderful. And please follow her. I mean, I just love that you just shared so much information with us. Um, thank you so much. And it's just been such a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you so much. 
No, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate this opportunity. It's been so much fun. And yes, definitely come out and see me and we can trade. We can play. We can, <laughs> play, we can and then, play. And then I will come back looking 28. <laughs> <laughs> Have a wonderful day. You too. Thank you for listening to the Aesthetic Doctor Podcast with Dr. Judith Borger. We'd love to connect with you outside of the show. Follow Dr. Borger on Instagram at Dr. Borger and find more online and ways to work with Dr. Borger at www.theaestheticdoctor.com. Until next time, be well.